welcome to Conversations. Our guest today for the first of a two-part chat is the composer and lyricist Adam Gettle. Conversations is Lehman College's series of discussions with major theater and musical figures of our time. <laughs> welcome to Conversations, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think the first time we met uh, was uh, in one of my apartments on Prince Street, and I was interviewing you for uh, uh, I was working on a, uh, a musical, uh, a musicalization of uh, Emily Post's Book of Etiquette of 1937, oh. and I wanted, to, I had a score, but I needed a new score, and we <laughs> talked, and I was very impressed with you, oh. and you oh. delivered some kind of sample, and it was very good, and then the project dropped, and, uh, but that's how we first met. Maybe and we should pick it up now. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It was 112 years ago, <laughs> and uh, uh, since then, uh, you uh, won the Tony Award for uh, Light and Piazza, a beautiful mm. and extraordinary piece, and uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, before then, I saw uh, Floyd Collins, uh, 1996 at Playwrights Horizons, which uh, uh, knocked my socks off. Uh, also, that was an extraordinary piece you, you did with Tina Landau. And uh, and then you also have done um, Love's Fire, which I don't know, uh, Myths and Hymns, which I don't know, which I would love to know, and uh, uh, The Princess Bride. I'm dying to hear something of that. I don't know if that'll ever, do you think that'll ever see the light of day? Well, um, I don't think so, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, but I'll certainly send you a tape of what I have. Because that's uh, then it's going to be legendary, <laughs> because it'll never see the light of day. These are very important. Uh, I may one day find a vessel for that material. But good. Uh, my my first question is a really a basic one. Uh, you're a composer and a and a, a lyricist. How did you learn to be a composer and lyricist? I had always been very involved with music, uh, and I was a boy soprano. Um, a uh, soloist uh, at the Met and the City Opera when I was a kid. Um, did a lot of Turn of the Screws and Magic Flute and uh, Pelias et Melisande and uh, Amal and the Night Visitors and That's things like that. That's perfect for, yeah. So I was around uh, music theater from a very young age. Uh, and I guess that would have been my formative education. Uh, as a performer? Uh, yeah, as a performer and, and also being around professionals and being around high-level scores and high-level theatrical minds was uh, very important to me, not just in a rehearsal room, uh, but also in life, I guess. Uh, where were you born? Lenox Hill Hospital, right here in Manhattan. Were you educated in New York as well? I was. Well, I went away after eighth grade to boarding school. Mm -hmm. So from then I was away, but up till then I was here. Do you think education helped you on a whole or hindered you? I think it helped me enormously. I wasn't a very good student. I was a resistant, uh, you know, defiant, authority, spurning type <laughs> kid. Uh, but it gave me a lot of energy to try to make something of myself outside of school. So almost um, in the negative, it, it helped me to learn because I wanted to make sure I had something to show for myself. So when I was in high school, I would uh, um, go to the church uh, from 6 to 8 before class, and the custodian would open the church for me where they had the one terrific piano, and I could write into this beautiful space on this lovely Steinway. And, uh, and I, I, I grew a lot by finding ways of getting out of my work uh, for school. And music was what I poured myself into. What was your, f your first piece that uh, would you say? Uh, well, I wrote a, 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 uh, a suite for, it was during that sort of Claude Bowling period when he was, his record was always being played. Uh, do you Claude remember Bowling? Bowling? Yeah, it was a, he was sort of a classical slash jazz uh, no, composer. No. And at any rate, I was playing a lot of jazz at that time. I played upright bass and electric bass and, uh, and uh, 
people who's writing a lot of jazz things. So this is sort of a jazz classical suite for two flutes and piano and, and a very unlikely combination. <laughs> I think that's the first piece I can think of. A couple solo piano pieces. Then I wrote a, a march for orchestra, which I proudly showed to Steve Sondheim and somewhat deflated, um, rightly deflated by him uh, on, on the subject of that piece. But uh, those are the first things I wrote, I think, around 14 years old. Did you always want to be a composer and a lyricist? No, no. I, I wanted to be, you know, an actor or a movie star or a rock star or something, sort of typical, uh, um, you know, sort of hopes and dreams of uh, a lot of American kids, I guess. I, and as, as I realized, I couldn't act at all. And, mm -hmm. um, and I didn't really like being in rock bands. I did that a lot, but I didn't get to be in charge. So after a while, it felt, it felt like... Uh, <laughs> It wasn't for me either. I like to kind of, I just wanted to tell everyone else what to do, so I eventually went into writing for the theater. But I backed into it. I didn't, uh, I, I wanted, because of my uh, grandfather uh, and his work, I, it was the last thing I thought I should try to do. I thought it was sort of um, professional suicide. It may well have been, but, it, but uh, um, I started to write for the theater, I guess, in college and hold on i think we should explain for the for the uh, one percent yeah. of the audience that that doesn't know who your grandfather was richard oh, sure. rogers uh yeah um richard rogers and uh, a, a well-known figure and an awesomely talented guy and uh and i always felt that would be a terrible choice to go into the field that he was in um but when i started doing it it was the hardest thing i had ever gotten involved with and so I feel that I'll be able to continue to, you just don't get good at it. You just keep trying to get better. Was he supportive? I only got to play him, I think, one thing before he died. Uh, he died when I was just 15. He was literally on his deathbed ac across the living room wall. His bedroom was here, the wall was here, and the piano was here. And he told me to play him what I had and play it loud because it had to come through the wall. And uh, so I really plunked it out, and, and uh, he said he liked it. <laughs> well, that's better than saying he didn't like it. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah and could, then dying. That could be a lifelong right curse. <laughs> right, so I go and, yeah. Now, uh, I've been listening again to Light in the Piazza, and uh, it, uh, I've listened to it like four times in, in two days and uh, obsessively, <laughs> and, uh, and it wasn't a chore at all. It was just uh, an obsession. It was fascinating. Mm. Uh, what struck me this time, I've heard it a lot before I saw the show, mm -hmm. what really got to me most was the chutzpah of doing a romantic show. That show is really romantic. Uh, now, when I was growing up, to do a romantic show was not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But to do a romantic show in an age of urine town <laughs> and, uh, and rent, yeah. uh, well, rent is romantic in a strange way. But this show is roses and wine and, uh, mm -hmm. and atmosphere and perfume. And I mean, it's really romantic. Mm. Why did you do that? I hadn't seen anything like that uh, in so long that I felt that, for that reason alone, we might have a shot uh, because it would seem to be fresh for the reasons you just uh, laid out. Um, but below that, I felt a strong um, impulse to explore the idea of reaching for the real thing. Mm -hmm through music, that music is um, a tried and true language uh, for um, investigating how we um, experience our emotional ambition. Did you find other people resistant to uh, wanting to do such a romantic show? I think that because that's really mind-boggling, what you did. The sort of purity of the impulse uh, attracted those kinds of people. And, ah, like and, 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 
and pushed the uh, other kinds of people away. And, and the, uh, the dedication is actually in Italian for those who want it, um, yet to be finalized, because we're not quite published yet. But, uh, um, and that's really the, the nature of the show, both uh, as far as dr uh, dramatically and um, commercially. <laughs> I guess that's the nature of any show commercially, for those who want it. But um, it's, it's especially uh, true in this, in this age of you're in town, as you said. The only show I, I think it r reminds me of it all and is uh, uh, Spring's Awakening, oddly enough, that, which, is, uh, which is pretty romantic, too. Mm -hmm. uh, but yours is more romantic. And uh, uh, the other thing that struck me as a musical thing is the orchestration, the, the, uh, again, in an age of blaring rock and roll, mm. to to have strings predominating mm -hmm. and woodwinds, uh, mm. that's really wonderful. Uh, it just is really delightful. Um, Thank you. When did you, uh, uh, when did you, was that part of the original conception or did you uh, the, come uh, across that? The idea all along was to allow the uh, story in its sort of, I guess, increasing fullness to dictate the, the timbres that would be associated with the telling of that story. So we actually, I started with um, very much the economic uh, um, side of things in mind and, and wrote it for a piano trio, um, piano, cello, violin, and, and, uh, and, and not, not the entire score, but the first impulses mm -hmm. were written out for that. And, and the first performances of anything from the piece were performed uh, in sort of piano trio format. Well, it still keeps that feeling. Yeah, it and it can really be done does. that way, which is um, something that I um, feel very strongly about, that um, you have to uh, keep the economics of producing theater in mind from the very beginning, even in choosing your subjects. Um, but at, at any rate, the, then um, I began to write a number of songs that came through the guitar. Um, and uh, so it sort of became piano trio plus guitar, which is a bit galumphing and uh, didn't have, it wasn't really rangy enough. The guitar needed to be amplified, which created a sort of double layer yeah. acoustically, which is a problem. And, um, and so the guitar kind of morphed into the harp, and then things were treble heavy, so we added a bass. So then we had five, and that's how it stayed mm -hmm. for uh, a couple years. And then when we came to New York, we were lucky enough to add 10 more players. And that's when it really bloomed into a, uh, what would be thought of as a string-based score. But I would say that instead of thinking of it that way, it's simply something in which counterpoint is very carefully tied to character and, and story. Well, this is uh, an accomplishment in itself. Uh, where did you uh, get the idea of doing Light in the Piazza? It's based on a novel by, I forget, I forget her Elizabeth name. Spencer. Yes. Uh, yes. Where did you get the idea? Uh, my mom. Uh, I was. I told her I wanted to write. Mary a, Rogers. Yes, Mary Rogers, and I wanted to write a romantic piece, and and um, she, suggest, she suggested a couple things, and then she said, you know, there was a story in the New Yorker, in the early '60s or late '50s that she particularly liked, and she had suggested it to my grandfather, and he had passed, but that I should look it up and see if it was still in print, and uh, I ordered it off of Amazon, Amazon.com, and I read it thoroughly and took a lot of notes. Um, and the, the, the problems that occurred to me narratively, dramatically, in that first reading continued to be problems right to the very last performance <laughs> in New York. But uh, 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 she, was the, she was the instigator of, of the whole thing. What kind of problems, uh, may I ask? I think that when and how you disclose the nature of Clara's uh, problem uh, is very important in terms of the audience is wrapping the audience into the storytelling. If you tell them everything too soon, you run the risk of relegating Clara to an unromantic place in that she would be sort of an after-school special oddity. And that, uh, and therefore, her relationship with Fabrizio is sort of we're talking about a, a romance of Americans and living in Italy or visiting Italy. Yes. Should I in do the a 50s. bit of a Just a very brief one. Clara and her mother, Margaret, go to Italy. They're, um, uh, I suppose, upper middle class. Um, and 
have been sort of sent off to uh, Italy, um, and we don't really know why until we begin to discover that Clara's mother's marriage is um, cold, and Clara be starts falling in love with an Italian boy uh, named Fabrizio, and they don't speak a word of each other's language at first, and, and music, music serves nicely there um, as both a stand-in for actual language and as a stand-in for a kind of physical communication that, um, you know, comes with that relationship. And we watch the mother do everything she can to keep them apart, and we don't understand why. Clara's 26 and beautiful and um, vivacious, and, but over the course of the story, Clara's behaviors begin to indicate that something isn't quite right with her. Um, and it turns out that she has uh, a kind of brain damage which uh, essentially arrested her emotionally um, at the age of 12. Um, and that's very important because as a young girl or a young woman, that's sort of the edge of emotional expectation, sort of the standing on that precipice of what life might offer up. And uh, so the entire score is sort of written in that mode of, of hoping and reaching and, and wanting something. And longing. And longing. the longing in the piece is, is incredible. Uh, everybody is longing. That, that's the, every that's how it's constructed. There are four couples, eight characters, and everybody's on that continuum somewhere. At one end would be complete bitterness and loss and disappointment <laughs> in romantic things. And at the other end would be um, that wild, uh, ecstatic bloom of of well, isn't that the love. story of, of your audience's lives? And, uh, right. Which is that was the, That's the real uh, bet or wager of, of this as a theater piece, is to hope that anyone in the audience will be on that continuum somewhere. We all have been on that continuum, one, one way or the other. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, now you worked with a total of, uh, of three uh, librettists uh, on that. Why did, uh, why, what, what prompted you to go? I don't mean uh, uh, bad things, but what, what was the process there? Um, Ending up finally with... With uh, Craig Lucas. Yeah. Um, well, Craig Lucas Alfred, Kiss, Alfred, and Alfred Urey and I began the piece together, and uh, I had seen Last Night at Ballyhoo. And Wonderful play. Loved that play, and so romantic. And we had a lovely time working together, but it didn't feel like we were really doing the dance. Um, uh, and I, I suggested that perhaps we weren't the perfect match for this material. Um, the next person I worked with very briefly on it was Arthur Lawrence. Um, and Your godfather. Yes. Uh, <laughs> now that must have been interesting. <laughs> yeah. um, well, you know, we really never even got down to work. We had, we, he had been sort of my consigliere during uh, the early uh, work on the piece mm -hmm. and a very helpful advisor um, and so seemed the logical choice and um, after all everyone ought to work with their own godfather on a theater piece uh, but it didn't uh, I think that I think that uh, for one reason or another um, Arthur uh, didn't feel that it was right for him and at that point I, I put it away and I thought well maybe I'll make a dance suite out of it I was sort of crestfallen and and um, started to look for other projects and Craig uh, and I were speaking on the phone and he, I think he asked me what I was up to and I sort of depressedly mentioned this thing and he said well let me let me come over and check it out so I played him a bunch of the songs and we just from from day one had a lot of fun together he's he's wonderfully funny he brought all of that to the piece also a terrific sense of structure and made the piece possible I mean he, he it wouldn't have happened uh, without a doubt it would not have happened without him um, right. Did you write some of the songs before you had a libretto? Yeah. I, I had, uh, oh, I, you forgot one collaborator, which is at one point I thought maybe I could do it myself. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and that was particularly mm -hmm. gruesome. Uh, I had, that was another one of my questions. <laughs> Have you ever tried to do your own libretto? <laughs> yeah, I just, I am lonely by nature, which sort of sucks because I have to be alone so much uh, mm -hmm. to write. Um, so, the idea of doing it all myself, music, lyrics, and uh, I mean, I'm never even, I don't want to write lyrics for a while. I would love to, to work with, 
with a with a lyricist or, or, or a librettist on on things for a while just because uh, just to be in a room with other people you know right I know what you mean yeah yeah you've described yourself as a method composer what does that mean <laughs> uh, I I, I, I love only meant uh, some, uh, I guess, uh, somewhat glibly that I do um, tend to write about things that I'm going through at the time. For instance, Floyd Collins was a piece that about a guy who got trapped in a cave in Kentucky, in Barron County, Kentucky, in 1925, and uh, he had been looking for a way to transcend his circumstances and found his. Uh, satisfaction and personal edification by being by discovering things uh, all on his own uh, down under the ground uh, completely separated from from the world and at the same time he really yearned to have voices all around him and and um, or at least as I imagined him uh, and uh, that felt very personal to me <laughs> um, as a writer and also it's about a guy who uh, has uh, this great aspiration, um, and he fails. I mean, he dies down there. Um, and I guess the, the the personal question for me that kept driving me through the piece was, you know, if I take up this career in this profession where my own grandfather was, uh, by some standards, the the most successful person ever, you know, um, and I and I don't succeed in the way that he did is there anything noble in that is it you know it was the very beginning of my career when I wrote the piece and I think that that question was um, not foremost in my mind but pretty much occupying my entire subconscious so so uh, so it came out in the piece the energy right? was directed towards Floyd Collins what prompted you to go from Flo uh, from Floyd Collins was there anything in between Floyd Collins and uh, and and the Martin Martin Piazza. Piazza. Yeah, there were a number of things. I mean, throughout my writing theater pieces, I have generally done documentary scores. Right. And that is another palette and another ah, another way of activating my yeah. my brain, uh, responding to picture, uh, responding to someone else's idea of how to tell a story, um, um, or how to uh, review some historical. Um, uh, circumstance, and that's a good way to activate me. And I often end up making things that are completely different in that way and sort of storing away new techniques for later. So it's a good thing, just sort of keeps my, you know, it's a, it's a good cat scratch for me. Um, so that uh, was always happening throughout. And also uh, I wrote a piece called Myths and Hymns, which was a strange sort of mating of these Presbyterian hymns um, and classic Greek mythology. And uh, I had, I found a, in an antique store this little book sort of shouted at me to buy it and I didn't know why. I, I didn't really look in it. I, I just, it was a beautiful tiny little book. It turned out to be a Presbyterian hymnal from 1876 from, published in Philadelphia. All these uh, words to these hymns, well-known hymns, come to Jesus and Jesus the mighty conqueror and as a Jew from the Upper West Side, they just just they, like, to you. they just called me. I don't know what it was. <laughs> uh, and uh, all this music started coming out of me. So I wrote new music for uh, these old words and these quite well-known words. Um, and uh, I was so grateful to have stuff just be generated that I just kept doing it. And at the same time, I was gradually making a stack of these myths. I would take up something like uh, Sisyphus. What do we know about Sisyphus? Well, well, most people know it's just the guy with the rock, and it was a, over and over again. And, and I tried to base them all on the things that all of us know, N not, not Robert Graves or Edith Hamilton, but, but we who don't know much about myths. What, whatever we do know, how would you take that and grow that into a, a tiny little theater piece or a song or whatever? So. I did uh, Hero and Leander and Medusa and uh, Icarus, and, um, and, then it, and then Tina was over, oops, I bet that wasn't good. Um, Tina Landau was over one day, and uh, I played her a bunch of this new material, and she suggested that we talk about how these two bodies of work might relate to each other. And it turned out to be um, fairly energetic, what, what ended up, uh, it was a song cycle, 
um, that did not really have a narrative structure but had a kind of subcutaneous um, logic to it um, in which the hymns were kind of our prayers and what we mean to do and the myths were what we actually do. <laughs> you, uh, you have a, an interest, you told me, in uh, the classics and uh, Greek mythology. And uh, 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 Have you worked on any other uh, classical stuff? Well, I did a piece. Uh, one of my first professional jobs was scoring a, an, an, an endless two-evening show called The Legend of Oedipus. Uh, at Williamstown. It was two evenings. It was, it was Nik Nikos Sakharopoulos' last piece. Oh, uh, my God. Yeah. So my, I killed my grandfather by playing him my, my <laughs> and music. And then I also killed, killed Nik Nikos by r scoring his last show. Uh, and uh, that was uh, over two evenings. And, and uh, I think Joan Van Ark was in it. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting this signal that uh, uh, that this first part is uh, is over, okay. and uh, uh, they're telling me we have to bring it to a close. I, I, I wanted to thank you uh, for, for coming here to Lehman College and uh, uh, joining us today. Uh, mm. Thank you. And uh, uh, we hope to see our, uh, our theater audience and our home audience on television uh, again soon for part two of Conversations with Adam Gettle. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.